The Eldridge Street Museum is among the most intriguing and beautiful in New York. And I'm thrilled to be moderating this evening of food, memory, and history with June and Nikki. Nikki, as everyone knows, I think, is fourth generation owner of Russ and Daughters. Who has been to Russ and Daughters? <laughs> I think it might be easier to say who has not been to Russ and Daughters. Oh, one person. And it's my very good friend, Stephen, and I promised him we would go one day. We're best friends since we're 15 years old. Um, I'm happy, oh, I also want to say that uh, Nikki's parents are here. Mark and Maria, and are here from Russ and Daughters. We are here to celebrate the publication of June's new book, of course, but also Nikki's newest adventures, and to schmooze about the city's uniquely Jewish culinary landscape, past, present, and future. It is Beshert to be presenting June's book in this sacred place, a national historic landmark built in 1887, the Eldridge Street Synagogue, now the museum in Eldridge Street, is an architectural symbol, a marvel really, of the aspirations and realizations of the immigrants who came mostly from Eastern Europe between 1820 and 1924. June's book is also the story of those who came to New York of hope in, in hopes of finding a better life. How fitting to be here. According to Bonnie Diamond, the museum's executive director, and a wonderful new friend, quote, this building stands as a testament to Jewish cultural traits. The need to remember, the impulse to celebrate, and the obligation to instruct. Tonight, we get to do all three. So let me tell you a little bit about you. I call her the beloved photographer of the collected memory of Jewish food. June is a superlative food writer, cookbook author, and culinary historian. Her first book, Recipes Remembered, a Celebration of Survival, is a living compendium of stories and recipes that she gathered from interviewing over 150 Holocaust survivors. And I just saw a little video of a talk June gave in Toronto this week to 300 authors of Holocaust survivors about that book. It was extraordinary. She also edited a book called Still Here, Inspiration from Survivors and Liberators of the Holocaust, and also wrote a book called Yogurt, A Global History. <laughs> and, this is, and this is pretty new. She's a, kind of a new food writer, so that's why we're all really in awe. Her latest achievement, Iconic New York Jewish Food, explores the richly textured mosaic of immigrant food that is sacred to the Jewish experience. June's mantra is, eat well, do good, and most of the proceeds of her books go to charitable causes. Her new release benefits the Med Council, which is the largest kosher food pantry in the country. June is a freelance writer for Westchester Magazine, the mother of two beautiful daughters, Allison and Jennifer, and a grandma of three, Henry, Aria, and Daisy. June is also a recent inductee to Les Dames de Scoffier and enjoys giving book talks and demos related to her work. Eat well, do good. Welcome, June. You are an inspiration. Nikki, let me tell you about Nikki. Practically born in a herring battle, barrel with a sharp knife in her hand, Nikki is the fourth generation owner of Russ and Daughters, New York's iconic Jewish food destination. Established 109 years ago by her immigrant great grandfather, Joel Russ, it was the first business, by the way, with and daughters in the title, which was a radical idea at the time. Nikki, along with her cousin Josh Russ Tucker, continued the legendary Russ tradition 
as the businesses continue to flourish. Nikki oversees the original Lower East Side Shop, the Russ and Daughters Cafe, and Russ and Daughters Brooklyn, which houses the company's Jewish bakery and nationwide shipping facility. A new location on Manhattan's West Side will be opening soon, and I'm sure Nikki will tell us about that. That's very exciting. Nikki has been featured in the award-winning documentary, Mr. Queens, in TV shows such as Taste the Nation and Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations, and in publications including the New York Times, the New Yorker, Food and Wine, Zagat, Vogue, and W Magazine. She's a recent inductee into the Manhattan Jewish Hall of Fame and was just immortalized as a beloved character in Lunch from Home, written by Joshua David Stein. Is Joshua here by any I just want to show you a book. Nikki is a beloved character in this wonderful new children's book called Lunch from Home. They're wonderful. And there are pictures of Russell and Daughters in it. The illustrator is amazing, and it's a very, very special book. Clearly, pairing is good for your health, and so is hard work. The three Russ daughters, one of them is your grandmother, Nikki, live to be 86, 97, and 101. Nikki is also hard at work opening new restaurants, working on the Russ and Daughters cookbook. Won't that be fabulous? It's called Russ and Daughters, 100 Years of Appetizing. And she's developing not one, but two television shows. And she's the mother of two very wonderful kids, Maya and Ilan. Welcome, Nikki. You are welcome.
when my big sister who was sitting there turned to me on the heels of our selling our family business. And she said, we did well, now let's do good. And I was trying to think what my good was going to be. And I'm not that good a person. Thank you for thinking I am, but I knew my good would have to be something that I would find fun and exciting and challenging. And so I went to the Museum of Jewish Heritage and I proposed that I would write a cookbook based on the stories and the recipes of the Holocaust survivor community that were members of the Museum of Jewish Heritage. That's how my food journey began. And it evolved since then, but it, it has only changed a little because the more I delve into Jewish food, the more I realize that what we are all nourished and nurtured on for so many decades, centuries, thousands of years, matzo being the first real recipe there ever was, these are really good, substantial, wonderful, delicious foods. My husband laughed after I tested all the recipes from the first book, and he said, for a year, we've been eating like 80-year-old Polish peasants. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, that's not a terrible thing. And so it led me to write this book on iconic New York Jewish foods, because those are really the same foods that I heard about over and over again from my Holocaust survivors the matzo ball soup, and the delicious chalk liver, and the pastrami that they craved and ate when they came here to America and heard so, so much about. These are the foods that they looked forward to, and the foods that so many Jewish immigrants brought to this country. So it, it seemed like an organic, natural thread to follow, going from my first experience 12 years ago to lead me to this book now. And it was a delicious journey. Thank you. And how did you and Nikki meet? Well, Nikki and I actually have met for the first time tonight. <laughs> I didn't know I had It's nice to meet you. Overdue, <laughs> We have spoken, and one of your associates, Eliza, is in the room tonight, and she was incredibly helpful because when I was hungry for photos of the most perfect appetizing foods, she provided me with photos from Russ and Daughters, and yes, I feel like I've known you now for a year and a half, but we're actually just saying hello to each other for the first time. That's so wonderful. I mean, was it one of those pictures made them on the cover? It did. It was actually, someone commented to me at the talk in Toronto, and they said, that is the most perfect food photo, and I said, well, the caption, it's a photo that's in the book, but it's a, a photo of, of an appetizing display understanding that Jewish people were managed to take a noun, and, and, and I'm sorry, an adjective, and turn it into a noun. I mean, something is appetizing. Oh, well, it's very appetizing. It looks good. It looks delicious. But to us, an appetizing store is a destination, Russ and Daughters being the, the foremost. And this picture, the caption really should read that you can gauge a Jewish occasion by the amount and the different amounts of smoked fish you have on the table. If it's just like a Sunday brunch, well, you have a little lox and bagels. But if it's a bris, you have herring. And truthfully, if it's a shiva, there's always a white fish. I, I don't know why a shiva seems to command a white fish, but it does. So the photo in the book really shows that beautifully from Russ and Daughter. Wonderful. I was going to ask uh, June what the criteria were for choosing the iconic foods, because iconic is a, a big word that usually applies to art or literature or celebrities. Um, so you mentioned that it really had to do with uh, a, a narrative that you heard growing up about what people uh, ate, mostly Eastern European. So Nikki, um, so that was kind of your criteria. I'd say my criteria first was what are the foods that I love? What are the foods that I crave? What do I want to binge on when I'm in New York City or in that New York City state of mind? And after that, what were the foods that my mother loved? You give her a good egg cream. She wouldn't put cheese on a cheeseburger, but it was okay to drink an egg cream with a hamburger. <laughs> Go figure. She yelled hot dog every time the Yankees got a home run. 
these foods were just imbued and imprinted on me, and I think that was one of my driving forces. And then, to be more author-like, yes, I did research. It wasn't just my personal favorite. You did a lot of research. So Nikki, this uh, is for you in terms of what are the iconic foods from Russell and Daughters that have stood the test of time? This is a several part question. Does something iconic ever lose its status? Was there something sold, sold in the store 100 years ago that is no longer there? And is there some new invention that is iconic worthy? And I have two in mind, so I'm very curious what you're going to say. Um, well, uh, I mean, Rust and Daughters the, starts with herring. The story starts with herring. So I would say certainly herring is iconic and a part of the appetizing mechanic. My great grandfather just stood on the streets of the Lower East Side right around here. First as a street vendor, kind of like one herring out of the barrel, and then he worked his way up. A push, uh, push card, a horse and wagon, and then a store in 1914. So, herring, of course. Um, you know, today I think of bagels, obviously bagels, bialis, um, but that was more, um, that wasn't from there from the beginning. Um, back in the day when my great grandfather first opened his store, if you wanted a bagel, you went to the Moishas Bakery. If you wanted the cream cheese, you went to Pink's Dairy. Uh, but over time, they became kind of integrated in uh, in our shop. Um, <coughs> you know, today we use the word lox as kind of a catch, a general term for smoked salmon. But the original lox, which we still sell amongst other things, is not smoked salmon. And that it's a salt cured um, salmon uh, that was prepared that way because it was before refrigeration, so you needed a way to, to preserve this fish. And um, so to think of the evolution, you know, the original lox, the, that classic uh, triumvirate, bagels, cream cheese, and smoked salmon that today we, you know, we call bagels and lox, that came to be because the original lox was not, was salt-cured salmon, it was very salty, and you needed the, the dairy and the cream cheese and the, the carb of the bagel to cut through that saltiness. So there's an, that sort of iconic status, there's a through line, but there's also an evolution <coughs> there. Um, and then you ask what has reached iconic status? What were you thinking? Okay, I'll tell you.
the other food, uh, I haven't had it yet, but someone raved the other day, it just raved and raved. There is a graham cracker, jelly, chocolate covered cookie confection. I don't know what you call it, but that sounds new and that sounds amazing. Well, if you, if you know the, for those of you who have been to the original shop, um, you know, you know there's kind of this quirky place where on one side you have this appetizing counter of smoked and cured and pickled fish and cream cheeses and herring. And then on the other side you have chocolates and dried fruits and vodka and rubble. So there's, you know, we call one side the fish side, what we call the other the, the candy side. Uh, in my grandparents' day, I, and I still remember, it, that side really was just full of bins of sucking candies because, you know, every Jewish grandmother had to have the, you know, the, the coffee bins and the English bins. <laughs> Boiled it, and by boiling it, they got around that edict. 
that prevented them from baking. Then they were allowed to bake it after because it wasn't considered a baked good. So that's how the bagel originally developed and the word, there are so many um, stories about how the word for bagel came to be. Bagen, B-E-I-G-E-N, in German means um, twisted and formed and shaped. There's also a story that says that there was a Jewish Viennese baker who wanted to thank the Polish king, who was an equestrian, for saving his town. And so he baked something in the shape of a stirrup, which in Polish the word is B-A-Y-G-E-L, bagel. That comes pretty close. And so many people feel that's the actual origin of the bagel. But truthfully, it really isn't. It's the origin of the word. But the bagel really started when they had to improvise how to create something that was familiar and satisfying and get around this, this law. I'll add that you mentioned locks and bagels, and cream cheese, and the combination. It was actually considered um, a slur for one Jewish person to call another locks and bagels. It meant that they had overly assimilated in America, and that if you were a true Jewish immigrant and true to your roots, you were just going to eat that salty, cured, but not smoked belly locks and forego the cream cheese and bagel, because as you said, that triumvirate is, is really the most satisfying way, but it was considered a negative. Nikki. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, in my, um, starting with my parents, uh, the third generation of Russell daughters became a little, um, uh, sugar, a little crazy. Customers would want a bagel and lox, and they'd come to Russell daughters for the fish, but they'd have to go get the, the cream cheese and the bagel somewhere else. And my, my folks really were the ones to start bringing that in house, and we started off by working with independent, um, bagel makers. Um, and, but over time, as as our you know as we grew, our volume grew, um, and the bagel makers got older and maybe more tired, it became harder and harder for them to keep up for the for the consistency to be what it needed to be. Um, and as and at the same time, the the popularity of bagels also meant that um, what we what a lot of people think of as a bagel today is very different from a true New York bagel, right? The, this kind of oversized, overly sweet, um, bread, blueberry, jalapeno, you know? <laughs> Our food really is one of these connecting through lines uh, across generations. And our goal is not to invent the newest version of a bagel, but to, to make a bagel that reminds you and is, has the same taste, shape, consistency as the bagel you had as a child. Um, to be able to connect people to who they are and where they come from through food and preserving that taste, memory, and continuity. So at some point it became uh, evident that we just had to open our own bakery, <laughs> which um, was a little, in and of itself, I'm sure, you know, because, you know, my cousin nor I were trained bakers, um, but we knew what we, what we were going for and um, started working for some years behind the scenes, um, and at some point we, we built out a bakery, uh, in first, the first one was in Bushwick, so it was just sort of, we were doing this under the radar, um, but in 2018, we moved our, our uh, baking operation to Brooklyn, um, Russell Dodge Brooklyn, it's uh, on Flushing and Vanderbilt, uh, it's part of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And you can now go and visit our bakery. So it was very intentional that we wanted our bakery to be uh, on full view to the public so that you could come, you can come and you can see the craft and the work that goes into making something as seemingly easy as a bagel, because it's not. You know, we, we still do it in a very old-fashioned way. It takes basically two days to make our bagel. Um, but following all the steps, you know, the proofing, the retarding, um, we don't cut any corners. We still use wooden planks with burlap on top. Um, and, and to, so, um, that could be said, the same could be said for Bialis and 
Babka and all of these um, Shisarai, Pumpernickel, you know, all these classic um, Jewish made goods were becoming, as they became very popular, they also became very mass produced. And um, that's why and how we started making bagels, but you won't find any blueberry bagels. That's wonderful. And Nisha, how many, if you can share with us, how many bagels do you actually produce a day, seven days a week? So on, on a, just a typical day, we probably produce around 250, 300 dozen, and during the holidays, around 800 dozen a day. Amazing. <laughs> These uh, numbers really are astonishing. I'm just looking, we're going to talk about delis in a few minutes, but uh, Jane Gill from Texas Deli, uh, they sell between 20 and 30,000 pounds of pastrami a week. Amazing. Jews like thinking. June, you interviewed 150 Holocaust survivors for recipes remembered. How many people do you think you interviewed for this book? And then I want to get into some of the actual personalities um, of who you spoke to. Well, I spoke to, I'll say, typical New Yorkers. And I think that's what's so illuminating about iconic New York Jewish food. When we were originally titling the book, we were going to call it Iconic Food That Happens to be Jewish. Because in speaking to just typical New Yorkers, and I trust me, my children are here who will testify that I will follow anyone into a restroom to ask them a question if I'm writing a book or I'm pushing a book. So I truly query people and I said, what do you think are the iconic foods? What are the foods that you associate with New York? And what's so wonderful is, is that it's just completely cross-cultural. That people don't realize that they are eating Jewish food when they're having a pastrami sandwich at Katz's or a potato knish or a bowl of chicken soup at uh, Sarge's. They, they don't realize these are Jewish foods. So first I started speaking to just really anybody I could talk to. I would speak to people on the subway, on the bus, at, at the crossroads of, of uh, Central Park, and, and ask them, what are the foods you associate with New York? And I will say the first one, aside from pizza, is bagels. And then after that, it's a litany of all the foods that we associate. I then, um, because I absolutely have no ability to be embarrassed, I reached out to every professional I could think of. And I just emailed and called and presented myself on the doorstep of every delicatessen and appetizing store and bagel maker and really just got information from them that was invaluable. I spent the morning at a bagel shop watching them make them on the planes with the burlap. I, I learned that if you go to a, a bagel shop and they suggest Oh, you know what? Maybe you want us to toast your bagel. Don't buy that bagel. That is not a fresh bagel. A fresh bagel does not need to be toasted. And if you toast it, you should only put butter on it. That's the rule. <laughs> no different than you don't put, you know, butter on on a pastrami sandwich. A Jew dies every time somebody puts butter on a pastrami sandwich. <laughs> don't, don't toast a fresh bagel and don't put butter on it unless it's a day old. Nikki, do you so, agree? Do you agree with the bagel? I, I absolutely agree with June, but I will say that, that it's it's a it's a it's a lost cause. Yeah. <laughs> we we used to uh, refuse. Actually, we didn't even have a toaster for the longest time. This, these are fresh bagels. You don't toast a fresh bagel. You're out of luck. When you say that a hundred times a day, it gets to be a little tiring. And finally, we gave in. So, okay, fine. People want them toasted. But it does kill me, especially in Brooklyn, because we our bakery, our, we have a, you know an appetizing counter for people to come and shop. It's right next to the bakery. You can see the bagel oven and the kettle right, you know, 20 feet from the counter. And people still ask for the bagel to be toasted. No, it's genre. It is genre. It, it, it should happen. I spent the rest of that day at the smokehouse. I I truly smelled like I had just been smoked and pickled, I'm surprised he let me in the house. But it, it, it is eye-opening when you speak to people who are really artisans of this, not people who are mass-producing it, 
but going to Zaro's Bakery and watching them handroll every bugla, watching them, you know, wrench every cookie in the black and white combination, which by the way is not really a Jewish food, but, but we allow it. Um, and it's just, it's, it's fascinating. So those are the people I spoke to and it's just, it's so inspiring when you see people who are doing it right and like you said, taking the pride and, and not just mass producing something, but really doing something that, that takes integrity, that brings the integrity back to that food and takes you back to its origin. Wonderful. Um, you know what you all said in terms of the one iconic food? So I have a list, bagels, bialy, smoked fish, green cheese, herring, lox, knishes, chopped liver, matzo balls, kohl, kasha varnishments, hot dogs, um, egg creams, hamba, kishka, krepla, celery soda. What am I missing? <laughs> Did other people have other things to say? Contest, 
and he got doctors and nurses to dress in lab coats so that the perception was that these hot dogs were clean and pure and, and healthful. I mean, they were none of the above, but he built an empire from it. Now, this is in Yiddish cup. Oh my goodness, that's a great story. Um, Nikki, do you sell conditions? We do. <laughs> Rockefeller for governor. Rockefeller ate a 
over to the guy and he said, what's that you're eating? And the guy turned to him, and again, food law, the guy turned to him supposedly and said, I'm eating the reason you are not governor. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. I have one last question, and we're going to open it up to the audience and be here for another hour or two, because I know you have lots of questions. Um, do either of you know the derivation of this comment? What am I, chopped liver? <laughs> and the reason I ask is because I'm a psychoanalyst in training, and I find that a very compelling question. <laughs> so, please. Well, I'm going to take a stab at it. I, I believe in something called the why to the what. Why we eat and do what we eat and do. Chopped liver was the condiment that you could put on a sandwich to help it gain a little bit more moisture because there were certain things that we could not put on a meat sandwich. You weren't putting cheese on the sandwich. And coleslaw kind of came about a little bit later, not terribly later, but a little bit later. But if you added the chopped liver, it gave it that little bit of that savoriness that sometimes sandwich just needs that little extra something, something. And so in the chapter I call Sidekicks, chopped liver is a sidekick. It goes alongside, no different than you got to have that kosher pickle and that Dr. Brown's black cherry. I mean, those are all obligatory things that you need to have on the side with your sandwich. I'm going to venture a guess that maybe that's part of why, what, do I, what am I, chopped liver? Because it's just always on the side. I like it. Nikki, and do you sell chop liver in the advertising store? Oh, we make delicious chop liver. In fact, um, before I came here, I was thinking <laughs> of, you know, that I wouldn't get to eat dinner for a long time, and what did I snatch on but some, some of our chop liver on a viali. Um, so to the question, what am I, what are you, chop liver? Yes, I am chop liver. <laughs> I say that with pride. Um, I don't know, the, I mean, the derivation of the, the phrase, but What's interesting is that Russell Daughters is one of the last remaining appetizing shops. And yet, we do transgress when it comes to chopped liver because technically in appetizing, in appetizing, there's, you, you, it's fish and dairy. Um, so chopped liver shouldn't be on our menu, but um, we make a fabulous chopped chicken chopped liver. And I think part of that is back to the origins of these foods. Chopped liver was a cheap form of protein um, and energy, you know, using uh, liver. Um, and you could, you know, a family could have that um, protein boost. So, you know, if you're in France and you call it flesh, it's very fancy. But uh, uh, it's really the sort of the shtetl origins of these foods that um, were sustenance and now are really just parts of our DNA. Um, one more question, <clears throat> and then you get the floor. It's almost Mother's Day, so I just want to bring this around to uh, mothers and grandmothers. Um, I had a podcast called One Woman in the Kitchen, and Nikki was on it, and June was on it, and I got to listen to the interviews again, and they were really wonderful. And you both talked about very special relationships with your grandmothers. Uh, June, your grandmother, there's even a street named after her in the Bronx, maybe uh, even a boulevard, so maybe quickly. And Nikki, your grandmother, one of the three amazing Russ daughters, how do their legacies live on in you? So I, I come from a mixed marriage. Uh, my mother was Ashkenazi, my father was Sephardic. And um, <laughs> so our, our food culture was imbued by both of those influences. So I had a uh, a Russian, uh, both my grandmothers were Russian, but one was married to a Sephardic man. So one made all your typical Ashkenazi food, and I just, I think that's what I most associate with Jewish food, or the foods that she would make, the matzo balls and the matzo ball soups, and uh, they were sinkers, not floaters, and um, they would sing for days in you, but um, that's a whole nother, whole nother story. But um, my other grandmother, actually influenced my cooking more because she introduced me to the Sephardic foods. She learned them from her mother-in-law because if she didn't, 
my great grandmother was a, a force of nature, and so she really had no choice but to learn how to cook Sephardic food. And it, it's those dishes that she taught me to make, uh, specifically a Sephardic matzah meat cake that I make at Passover time. And it is, it's, it's like manna from heaven to my family. They're all nodding because if God forbid I would show up without trays and trays of matzah meat cakes. There was one year where I kept them in the garage and some ants, but they're all nodding, climbed all over them. And my nephew said, I think if we just brush them off, we can still eat them. So that my, my grandmother's really imbued me with that. My mother was a fabulous holiday cook. She really talked more about food than prepared it, but she was a, she was a fabulous holiday cook. We called her the Yuntif maker. My father is really the cook in, in the family. And so I just think it's, it's so generational. And, and I implore everyone here who's young enough that you have your parents and grandparents, or old enough that you are the parent and grandparent, to teach that younger generation how to make these dishes because telling them to use a bissel of this and a handful of that is just not going to reproduce it the way they are used to eating it when it when you make it so take that time next time you prepare one of these iconic foods to your family and show them how to make them thank you so my grandmother Anne was the youngest of the three rust daughters um, she passed away at 97 in 2018. And you have to appreciate that she and her two sisters were, um, started working at the shop when they were 10, 11 years old. Um, they, I mean, they went to school, but after school, <laughs> on the weekends, it was about work. This is how the family uh, survived. Um, she was not given the choice of what she, you know, to choose her life path. She was even expected to marry a man who would be a good worker and would come and, and uh, join the business as well. And she did that. Um, but this was, she, in her lifetime, um, when she was at the shop, it was not her choice. And there was no, there was no, there was no night like this celebrating iconic Jewish foods. There were no fabulous books like June's. Um, she did not have that sort of validation that this work was important and meaningful. So I think that her seeing her granddaughter choose to do this, you know, her granddaughter was given every opportunity to, you know, to be educated and do what I wanted to do, that I chose to come back and make Russell Motors my life's work was incredibly validating to her.
you know, had to get very scrappy, very, you know, as, as tight as we could be during COVID. I, we went from having four locations and 162 employees to going down to, um, we had 50 employees at our lowest. <coughs> so um, while that is not reopening, I'm, the, you know, I'm so happy that we, we did it and we could have a presence on the Upper East Side. Um, this, in June, if everything keeps going well, uh, we'll be opening Russ and, Daughter, uh, Russ and Daughters on 34th Street, 10th Avenue, so all the way west. Um, very different from the shtetl of the Lower East Side. And it will have a bagel bakery right on site. It'll actually be the first thing you see when you walk into the space will be our bagel bakery and we'll have, it's, gonna, it's a spectacular space and um, we'll be able to really, you know, reach a whole other part of the city. And that's part of the evolution of Russell Daughters, to keep as much the same as possible while also keeping it moving forward and, and continuing to reach um, a wider audience. If you are shipping to far flung places, what did, what, where has been the most surprising Did everyone hear that? Okay. Um, well, I'll tell you one that just happened a few weeks ago. Um, got a call from a customer who is, uh, his family, the Slavkins, have been uh, customers for three generations. So the grandparents shop from my grandparents, um, second generation work, you know, shop with my parents, and um, one of the members of the second generation called up and said that his 51-year-old um, nephew uh, was about to pass away uh, from cancer. He went to see his nephew in hospice, and his nephew said, um, Uncle, I have a, I have a request. Kurt said, of course, what is it? At my funeral, I want Russ and Daughters served. So Kurt called and put us on notice. And unfortunately, maybe not even a week went by when he called to place the order. And we shipped, this is not an exotic location, you know, she went to Chicago, but we sent smoked salmon and forks for 250 people to fulfill, literally, um, his last wish. A question for Jubal. First of all, thank you so much for this um, lovely event, and uh, I, I, I love part two, just throwing it out there. But um, I'd love to hear more um, related to the book. Um, you started to talk about how originally it was happy to be Jewish foods but then you made it iconic Jewish foods, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, and uh, perhaps some of the people, the Jewish folks that you did work with, you know, you know get some interesting stories from, and uh, maybe one that struck you particularly, or, yeah. I, uh, I'll tell you, and it was post-writing the book. I was at a book talk at a Barnes & Noble, and there was this man sitting there, and he's asking a million questions. And he said, I come from a very Italian background. I don't think I've ever had Jewish food, but it sounded like an interesting book talk. And I said, really? Have you ever had a, a, a corned beef sandwich? He says, yeah. I said, do you ever have a, a Hebrew national friend? He says, yeah, yeah, I've had that. I said, uh, what about Dr. Brown's, you ever try a cellmate? He said, somebody told me to try that, that it's interesting. And I said, then you've eaten New York Jewish food. So I think the most interesting people I spoke to, honestly, were not the professional people. They should know their stuff. And they should be expert in what they're doing. Um, Acme Fish, who is a great purveyor of, of smoked salmon, gave me great advice that they said, don't ever buy the fish that you see that's already sitting there. You want them to hand slice it thinly in front of you because that's how all the oils are really um, uh, really maintained, and that's when you get that silky, wonderful. So 
so that was a, a good tip from them. He also said that um, he said that smoked uh, that pickled herring and smoked fish is a gateway drug. Um, <laughs> he said it, it takes you to just places that you just don't really want to go because once you start eating those foods, you really can't stop. Um, Peter Shelsky from Shelsky's, which is a really wonderful, and I'm going to call them a deli, not an appetizing store, even though they have smoked fish products there, but they're a deli as far as I'm concerned. And he was telling me that he's finding that there's a real rebirth and a real resurgence of these foods, that there's a whole new generation of people, not Jewish people, just people, everyday people who are coming in who are fascinated by these foods, who have seen them in other iterations and heard about them at other times, and they want to sample it, they're trying to do it in a new, maybe a reinvented way of the classics. But Peter said to me, he says, I'm basically a 70-year-old Jew in, in a 40-year-old body, because he says, you give me some pickled blocks and, and, and pickled herring, and I'm a very happy camper. So it was interesting hearing from some of those who are doing it like Russ and Daughters, the way it was done, and are preserving that for over a hundred years, and then it's also interesting finding and speaking to those people who are reinventing it a little bit, putting a spin on it to attract more people to enjoy these foods. Unfortunately, the deli is, is, a, is a dying institution. There are not that many great Jewish kosher delis anymore, and a store like Russ and Daughters is, it's a one-of-a-kind store. They're not all over the country, or even all over the city, stores like that. So you really have to cherish the ones who are doing it right, and applaud those who are trying to, you know, put a little bit of a spin on it and, and make sure that it stays relevant. Well, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yes, sir. <laughs> I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is, uh, relates to uh, chopped liver. Uh, I, I'd like to give you another interpretation. Uh, chopped liver, from a commercial point of view, is not appetizing in the sense that you wouldn't get it in an appetizing store. Uh, aesthetically, it's also not appetizing. <laughs> and it's not something that you would gravitate to on the buffet. So I think when somebody says, what am I, chopped liver? Uh, he's recovering from an insult that's given to chopped liver because it gets at the bottom of the gastronomic heap. But I, I have a question for Nikki about uh, salmon. Uh, if you go to the supermarket and you get this, these packages of smoked salmon, uh, they're bright orange. Uh, there's not a, a hint of fat in them. Uh, if you go to Russ and Daughters, you get salmon that's unctuous and layers of fat that you can see. Uh, what's the difference in how you buy and they buy and why is it that way? Uh, well, we, we, first of all, we, what you buy on the supermarket has been sitting on that shelf for who knows how long. Um, and it's been machine sliced and typically it's not the, you know, the highest grade of salmon that's not making it into those packages. Um, so we uh, have, well, we reject probably 30% of what comes in. Um, we, it doesn't, it, everything moves through us and daughters within a day um, or two at most. And we continue the craft of hand slicing, as you mentioned. So that is, it makes all the difference because you don't have the heat of those machines uh, damaging the, the, the fiber and the integrity of the flesh of the salmon. And by hand, you can you can get it to be that you know paper thin slice, and you're and you maintain the oil, um, the good oil, right, omega three fat that that stays in the salmon. And you also have a choice. You know, another thing is there's no one monolith of smoked salmon. If you walk into Russ and Daughters, you look at the showcase, you're going to see eight different kinds of smoked salmon, and it's sort of like the Jewish wine store. You know, where each one has a very specific flavor profile and fattiness and smokiness, and so there's it, there's a question, there's a conversation that 
is elicited across the counter. Like, well, what do you like? Do you like it fatty? Do you like it lean? Do you like it smoky? Do you like it, you know, uh, not so smoky? And maybe there's some tasting that happens. And um, and so it's it's that whole it's that whole experience, but also really a, that you know that dedication to maintaining the craft and the quality of what we did. Wonderful. Do we have time for a few more? Um, well, I will do two more. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Well, first, I just wanted to say, um, Nikki actually did a whole high, like important high school paper and food tour uh, based on Russ and Daughters when I was in high school. Um, so I'm very happy to see you continuously continuing that legacy. Um, but my question is for June. Um, you just have me here wanting to hear more stories. You tell them so well, and I just want to know, is there the big old one that was actually really interesting to me because I didn't know that. And I was wondering if there were any other stories that, you know, the younger side of the Jewish community that isn't being told all these stories all the time that you think is uh, worth like telling us and amusing because these are all very interesting and making me feel so excited and connected again. So my, my publisher would say to me, well, if you buy the book, <laughs> you get to hear all the stories. But the truth is, if you follow me home, you probably get to hear all the stories also. Um, I love the idea that in Brooklyn, there is a candy company. Everybody had it, at, at, at least in my house, we always had it at our table. The Joy Good Chocolates, they are either the chocolate rings or our mom would put it in the freezer so they could break a tooth, but that's how she used to eat the, the marshmallow twist from Joyva. So Joyva is, happens to be a Jewish immigrant family, Nathan Wodudski, and when he came here, he was a confectioner, and he not only made chocolates, but he made halva, which is again one of those foods that you would see in only in appetizing stores, and, and Nikki describes it perfectly. You have one side with the smoked fish and, and the pickled foods, and then on the other side you have the dried fruits, the dried nuts, the halva, and for some bizarre reason, strings of dried mushrooms, which I really don't understand. Go ahead. Well, I can tell you that story. Okay. <laughs> so you, actually, in the window of Russian numbers, you will still, yes. you still have dried Polish mushrooms. Um, they're called borovic. And um, they were, back in the day, a cheap meat substitute. So, you know, they have this very, they have a very uh, intense uh, flavor and kind of toughness and umami to them. And if you couldn't afford meat, you could trick yourself uh, into thinking you were eating meat with these mushrooms. And a little bit of the barovic would go a long way. So the best mushroom barley soup is made with these mushrooms. But whereas they were cheap back in the day, today uh, they go for about $200 a pound. So, yeah. Oh, so, Shada, so this factory made halva, and when they expanded, and when they became so big, and they're the largest producer of halva in the country, Joyva is now, they got a special permission from Brooklyn, and they run under the street from one factory on one side of the street to their other factory on the other side of the street. There is a pipeline that flows halva tahini, ground sesame. It flows under a street in, in Brooklyn. There are truffle dogs in Italy. I'm sure there has to be some animal in New York that can smell out tahini. And we can go to that street in Brooklyn and just find it. But it flows from one side of their factory to the other. And, um, and yes, that story and more is in this book. <laughs> I'd just like to say how important this lecture is in terms of the legacy that you carry, how important Russian Daughters is to New York City, how important chronicling the story of Jewish food is important in your book. Um, I also think as I sit here, I'm very hungry. <laughs> but my question is really a simple one. It goes back to the desert island idea. If you only had one Jewish food, this is for all of you, that you could eat, 
from here on in. What would that happen? Okay, I think this is considered a Jewish food, but um, my comfort food growing up was cabbage and noodles. I could eat that morning, noon, and night. Uh, I don't think mine is as good as my mother's or will ever be. I keep trying, um, but that would be it for me. I think mine would be my mother's uh, matz meal sugar pancakes. She made them at Passover, and I made them for my grandchildren. And um, my sister and I remember just dousing them in, in granulated sugar. I did to talk about a, a food coma. I mean, we were just bouncing off the walls after we ate them. But it's interesting that when I wrote recipes, remember, one of the survivors gave me a recipe for Monsignor pancakes. I, I didn't realize that other people outside of you ate them. Oh, it, I mean, it, it, lots of variety. Well, yeah. they, but they are, they're like little pancakes, and they're made with matzo meal, egg, and milk, and just a dash of salt, and then you put sugar on top of them, so that would be, that would be my desert. For me, it's the, uh, the classic bagel locks. <laughs> Sesame bagel, scally cream cheese, castanova. I want to do it up a little, put some salmon on it. Um, <laughs> I make one for myself almost every day. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't get old. And uh, for me, it's the food that really connects me um, back in time, but also thinking about the legacy of this food and how I think it speaks to, to people today beyond just the, the Jewish world, beyond New York. Um, and I think that is. Um, a beautiful legacy. I also want to thank um, Sophie and to thank Zaros and Seltzer Boys and to all of you for coming and making it such a special evening. Thank you so much.